Welcome all of you gathered here. Welcome to those of you who are watching live stream. I just want to make a comment about our live streaming. This is the last Sunday that we are going to be doing that. We're going to suspend that for a time only because we want to uh, pre-record some messages and some worship experiences, songs, prayers, and other things. That's going to begin next week and that will still be Sunday mornings at 10 o'clock but it will not be a live stream of this worship service, but a pre-recorded service. We hope that this will enable us to present a, a stronger, better worship experience for all of you. So I just want you to be aware of that. Please do stay for coffee after this service is ended. Some of you have already enjoyed that before our service began. We are uh, very much grateful for visitors who are here and love to spend some time in conversations with you uh, following this time of worship. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Lord God, thank you for bringing us to this place today. Our lives take so many unexpected twists and turns, but here we are together in this place at this time. You've brought us here, Lord. We are here to meet with you. We long to see your face. We want to receive a blessing from you, and we know that you will do all of this and more. We thank you for the songs we sing, for the joy that is in our hearts in spite of all of the sadness and challenges that we face. May our worship be pleasing to you, Lord, and may it be good for us so that when we leave this place, we will continue to sing the songs of salvation in whatever way we can. Thank you for hearing our prayer. In your strong name we pray. Amen. Sweet 
to trust in Jesus, just to take Him at His word, just to rest upon His promise, just to find ourselves in the wilderness of life when we need to know how good it is to trust our Lord. And we can. We're going to watch a little video this morning that explains why Jesus, or why God rather, brought his people from the Old Testament into the wilderness. That's what we're thinking about this morning. It's a, it's a little snippet from a pastor who is going to be preaching a sermon on the wilderness wanderings of the Old Testament people. And he's introducing that Sunday's message in just these two minutes uh, of this video. And I just wanna mention this because it's something that we're going to be doing more of in this church as well. Not so much in the worship services, we're gonna be watching videos, but some of you may remember the compass point videos that um, I recorded midweek, sort of anticipating the, the message that was going to be brought that following Sunday. It's what we'll see this pastor and hear this pastor speak about. And we're going to be reviving the Compass Point videos, just small videos of our own that we will uh, be making to uh, let people understand and appreciate a little bit more what we're going to be talking about and reflecting on that next Sunday. So this pastor's name is Mark Lanier, and he is introducing his message on Sunday on how God leads in the wilderness. Let's watch finishing touches on my Sunday lesson that I teach live each Sunday on the internet. Always welcome to join us, www.biblicalliteracy.org, or we'll put links down here. But anyway, I'm really excited about this Sunday because I'm continuing in the walk to Emmaus how Jesus used the Old Testament, starting with Moses, to explain to, to two of his disciples why he had to go through the whole ordeal of, of the crucifixion and, and the resurrection. And, and I love that story because it gives a chance to really open up the Old Testament. 
and to really explore some of not just the themes, but the prophetic word. And one of the things that I won't get time to talk about Sunday, but, but is just a very simple truth that I really love is our video thought for the day. And here it is. When God called Israel out of Egypt and into the promised land, he didn't simply give them a phone with a GPS on it. He didn't simply give them a map. He didn't simply say, hey, go north by northeast till you get to the Israeli border. No, God led the people through the wilderness, a pillar by fire at night and a pillar of cloud by day. And so night and day, God led Israel through the wilderness, the best route for them to go to be prepared to be the people they needed to be when they reached the challenge of the promised land. I love that fact. That simple fact is affirming to me every day because it tells me that God hasn't just stuck me on this planet with a general how-to-do book or even a general direction of go that way. God is involved in my life trying to lead me and he'll lead me through circumstances. He'll lead me through others. He'll lead me through my mind and what I think is best and how I think I should be doing things when living by godly principles. He leads me through his word, which is why it's so important to spend time each day in a devotional way before the Lord, looking at scripture, praying, seeking his guidance. And when we do that, we are following the lead of the Lord through our wilderness which is the time he uses to prepare us for where we need to be and what we need to be doing for him. It's a simple yet incredibly important principle. And so as we pull into the weekend and I finish getting ready for my lesson, links, 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 if you want to watch this live, 11 o'clock central time, it's a critical lesson for me that I need to apply. I need to follow my Lord through this wilderness of life, knowing he'll prepare me for the challenges I need to face tomorrow. I hope you'll join me in that uh, commitment to follow God today. God bless you.
nothing. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. God that we've just sung about and sung to is the one who is pleased to hear us when we pray. He's especially happy to know that we celebrate his goodness even in all the hard things of life and cling to his faithfulness when we struggle, when we wonder what the journey of life is really all about. So let's pray to God and continue to experience the joy of his presence as we do that. Please pray with me. Gracious God, thank you for your love, for your guidance, for the hope that you give us every step of the way in our earthly journey. Life, Lord, is sometimes so fulfilling, so joyful and abundant, and we celebrate that when we have opportunities to mark milestones in our lives, birthdays, anniversaries, weddings, accomplishments that we have hoped for and have worked hard for, but Lord, we know that life isn't always so joyful. We suddenly and unexpectedly at times find ourselves in hard places. And we wonder where you are and what you are doing in the world and in our lives. And especially then, Lord, we, we cry, we pray with urgency, with a sense of expectation and hope. And we know, Lord, that you are with us as our good, good Father. That you have a plan for our lives that is impossible for us to understand fully, but one that we can trust. And so, Lord, in this time of worship, we are reminded of how good you are to us and how blessed we are to know that we are never alone in this world. You surround us with people who walk this journey with us, who give us so many good blessings. We share laughter with them, we receive the gifts that they give, and we pray that we will always do that for others too, Lord. We marvel at the beauty of creation in these summer months. And yet, Lord, we know that this part of the world, like so many others, is a place where rain is needed. And we pray that you will soon open the skies and send rain, especially as farmers and others who work the field need to receive that replenishing, cleansing, healing rain. And as we Think of the important and good work of World Renew, that agency of your kingdom as so many others is seeking to improve the life of those who live in communities facing hardship and unimaginable challenges. We pray that you will bless their efforts to bring clean drinking water to the millions and millions of people in this world who don't have access to clean water as we do. We take so many things for granted, Lord. And we pray that you will enable us to always remember the needs of the world around us, the hurting, the impoverished, the lonely, the forgotten, the marginalized and excluded. Help us to serve them, Lord, as you have so wonderfully served us. We thank you that your work in the world is growing. Sometimes it seems hard for us to understand and perceive that because there are things that happen in our lives and all over the world every day that make us wonder if you really are the king of the universe. It seems like the, the sway and influence of evil is something that has the upper hand. But we know, Lord, that you are God and that this world and all things in this universe submit to you 
And you can use even evil and suffering and discouragement to accomplish something good. And we thank you for servants of your kingdom who are present here and all over the world who preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, sharing the good news of salvation in him, and who work to improve the the lives of so many in communities that have been torn apart or who live in poverty. We thank you for Ryan Faber and others who travel to distant places to be your examples, your faithful disciples there. Help us to know, Lord, that we are in this place to do the very same thing. And so we pray that you will continue to bless and guide us as Compass Community Church. We see changes beginning to happen in this place as our building is being transformed. We look forward to seeing more of this in coming weeks and months. And we want to know, Lord, that this is happening so that we can become a greater witness in our own community of your love and lead people into a relationship with you. We know that this is what you want us and all of your disciples and church communities to do. And so we trust you, Lord. We are following you. As the Old Testament people followed the cloud, the pillar of cloud by day and of fire by night, we are following you, trusting you, believing you. And we thank you for showing us, surprisingly, how you are at work in this place. And in this place, Lord, there are many who need prayer, who need assurances of your love and faithfulness in the wilderness that they are dwelling in. We remember those who are battling disease. Sometimes it weighs them down, not only physically, but emotionally and spiritually. We pray that you will give them strength and courage, that their family members and friends who sometimes feel so helpless as they see a loved one struggle may also experience each day the strength and peace that you alone can give. And so hear us as we pray for Andrew and Don and Roger who battle cancer and who are receiving treatments for that. May those treatments work effectively and bring them to a a remission and a clean bill of health. We pray for Betsy who broke her wrist recently asking that you will give her healing, Lord. We pray for others who experience pain and Injury, ongoing health issues, mental illness, discouragement. Lord, may your Holy Spirit fill their hearts today. We pray that you will give them a powerful blessing today and use us to speak words of hope and life into all of the uncertainty and sadness of their lives. We thank you, Lord, that Mika is celebrating a birthday today. It brings to mind the very beginning of her earthly journey here many years ago, but now that journey, like for so many of us, has taken a very different and unexpected turn. And so we pray that you will strengthen and bless her, Lord, give her healing, give her peace. We thank you for her strong testimony of faithfulness and trust in you. How good it is to know, Lord, when we see loved ones, brothers and sisters in Christ who are struggling, how good it is to see a smile on their face and the hope that only you can give, radiate from them. It's a blessing to so many. Thank you for friends and family that are with her to celebrate her birthday, to walk alongside of her in this very difficult way. And we pray that you will help us all to realize, Lord, that at any time our lives can take an unexpected turn. Help us always to be prepared for that, to be ready for it, and to know that you are with us no matter what experiences we may find. And we know, Lord, that you have given us your Bible as a guide, as a light that shines on our path. One of the most important ways that you lead your people and each of us as individuals. And this old story that we will now read, Lord, is so simple and yet so powerful and beautiful. It speaks words of blessing and hope to us in our wilderness journeys. And so may these words strengthen our faith in you, Lord. And may your church all over the world be blessed today. For this we pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. We're turning again to the Old Testament book of Numbers today. Chapter 9, beginning at verse 15 and reading through verse 23. On the day the tabernacle, the tent of the covenant law was set up, the cloud covered it. From evening till morning, the cloud above the tabernacle looked like fire. That is how it continued to be. 
The cloud covered it, and at night it looked like fire. Whenever the cloud lifted above from above the tent, the Israelites set out. Wherever the cloud settled, the Israelites encamped. At the Lord's command, the Israelites set out, and at his command, they encamped. As long as the cloud stayed over the tabernacle, they remained in camp. When the cloud remained over the tabernacle a long time, the Israelites obeyed the Lord's order and did not set out. Sometimes the cloud was over the tabernacle only a few days. At the Lord's command, they would encamp, and then at his command, they would set out. Sometimes the cloud stayed only from evening till morning, and when it lifted in the morning, they set out. Whether by day or by night, whenever the cloud lifted, they set out. Whether the cloud stayed over the tabernacle for two days or a month or a year, the Israelites would remain in camp and not set out. But when it lifted, they would set out. At the Lord's command, they encamped, and at the Lord's command, they set out. They obeyed the Lord's order in accordance with his command through Moses. This is God's word. We're going to stay in the wilderness for some time this summer. Reflecting on stories from the Old Testament, the books of Exodus and Numbers, that describe the journey that the people of Israel took centuries ago, the journey that took them out from Egyptian slavery and into the abundance and freedom of the land of Canaan. Last week, we began by reflecting on that incredible passage where spies went out into the land and brought back out of the land of Canaan grapes, huge grapes. They had a feast in the wilderness, a, just a little taste of what the Lord had in store for them. And we're going to be jumping around in the books of Exodus and Numbers. We're not going to be following their journey chronologically, which in a way is entirely fitting when you think about life in the desert or a pilgrimage. There's a lot of uncertainty, a lot of unexpected twists and turns in the journey. Things don't happen as you would expect them to. And it's really a fitting part of the Bible for us to be thinking about for another reason. We're on a bit of a journey ourselves as a church as Compass Community Church, our new name, our new identity, a new sense of mission. We're beginning to see some of the changes that are taking place in this building, and we're going to see more of that over the next number of weeks and months. We're going somewhere as a church. And there's lots of excitement about that. There's a lot of gratitude associated with that, as God is providing, working, and leading but with all of this, there's always a sense of apprehension and uncertainty as well. We wonder about where we're going sometimes. We wonder if God is really the one who's leading us. And sometimes we feel a little lost in a different place. It's not always as familiar as it once was. Some of us miss some of the things that we've left behind. The people of the Old Testament certainly as grateful as they were to leave their Egyptian slavery, sometimes fondly looked back on their time in Egypt, thinking that was much better than the place that they were. And so we wonder, as they must have wondered, where is God in all of our journeying, in all of the unexpectancy, in all of the uncertainty? How can we be sure about what God is doing and how he's leading us? Now, it's what makes this account of how God led the people through the wilderness by a cloud so interesting. A pillar of cloud by day that would stay in one place sometimes and then would move. And as we heard a number of times from the scripture reading, if the cloud stayed, the people stayed. If the cloud moved, the people moved. And a cloud of fire by night that lit up the darkness, even in their evening and nighttime journeys. It's so simple. And on the one hand, it seems almost unnecessarily repetitive for the narrator to keep saying the same thing many times. When the cloud stayed, the people stayed. When the cloud moved, the people moved. Sometimes the cloud stayed a short time, so the people stayed a short time. Sometimes the cloud stayed a long time, and the people stayed a long time. We get it. And yet we wonder. Wouldn't it be great if God led us 
that way today. I mean, we'd never have to doubt what direction we're going in and where God wants us to go. We'd always know it. We would just follow the cloud. We'd stay in one place or we would move only because of what we saw, that big puffy or fiery cloud doing up in the sky. Life would be so simple if it was like that. All of the decisions that we would have to make would be made for us. Life would be pretty easy to figure out, especially when we find ourselves in those difficult and hard places, when it seems as though we've lost our bearings and we can't quite figure out what life is about and and where we're going, when we've got decisions that need to be made and we just don't know what to do, wouldn't it be great to just follow the cloud? Well, let me just say two things about that because I think we tend to overestimate how easy life would be if we were guided by a cloud like the Old Testament people were. In the first place, if a person's relationship with God was really that simple, everyone would believe in God. You'd be a fool not to. Why wouldn't you? If it was really that simple, the journey of life would be as easy as following the big cloud in the sky. Who wouldn't want to be able to do that and live that easily and successfully? But we know life isn't that easy. In fact, life sometimes is incredibly complex. And one of the biggest parts about being a Christian is realizing that faith is essentially a matter of trust. It's not having everything all figured out. Like the pastor in the video said, when when God led the people into the wilderness, he didn't give them a GPS and step-by-step instructions about where they had to go. Life isn't that easy and straightforward. Life is all about trust. I'll say more about that next week, but for just this morning, I want to remind you of something I think I've mentioned before. Frederick Beekner, a great writer, Presbyterian pastor, once gave a commencement address at Union Seminary in Richford, Richford, Virginia, Richmond, Virginia. And these were great words that he shared with a class that was graduating and poised to enter a new stage of life with all of the uncertainty and expectation associated with that. He reflected on how he had gone through an incredible spiritual crisis not long before that. I was sitting by the side of the road, he said, one day last fall. It was a dark time in my life, full of anxiety, full of fear, full of uncertainty. The world within seemed as shadowy as the world without. And then, as I sat there, I spotted a car coming down the road toward me. And it was a car that had one of those personalized license plates. Just one word on that license plate. Of all the words the license plate might have had on it, the word that it did have was this word, T-R-U-S-T, trust. And as it came close enough for me to read, he goes on, it became suddenly for me a word from on high. And I give it to you, all of you graduates, as a word from on high also for you, a, a kind of a graduation present. The world is full of dark shadows, to be sure. Both the world without and the world within. And the road we are all setting off on is long and hard and often hard to find. But the word is trust. Trust the deepest intuitions of your own heart. Trust the source of your own truest gladness. Trust the road. Above all else, trust him. Trust him. That is a word from on high. And it's a word that I give to you as a word from on high this morning. Trust. The Bible isn't a manual that has answers to every question a person could ever ask. We don't always know the way forward, but we know some things. We know that God is faithful, that he is worthy of our trust. We live by faith, not by sight, is how the Apostle Paul puts it. So a big part of a person's relationship is simply trusting God, following God, not because we've got everything all figured out, but because we don't. 
It's what makes the wilderness so hard. We get lost there. God seems hard to find there. Eugene Peterson had a friend who was a fellow pastor. Pastoring a church in Baltimore, Maryland. One night he went out to walk his dog and he was mugged by some young thugs who took his watch and wallet, boot, uh, beat him up pretty good, kicked him in the ribs, broke a few of his ribs. It was a traumatizing experience. And this pastor told Eugene Peterson that he was looking forward to leaving for a month vacation to try to find peace in the wilderness. He was going to spend a month in the Grand Tetons of Wyoming, far, far away from the crime-ridden city. Six weeks later, after this pastor had come back from Wyoming, Eugene was surprised to see him with his arm in a sling. What happened? He asked. Well, I was riding a horse on a trail in the Wyoming Rockies. The high country there is so beautiful and pristine. The nearest criminal is at least a hundred miles away as the crow flies. But suddenly, the horse that I was riding got spooked by something. I was thrown from the horse to the ground, writhing in pain with a broken arm. And he said this, It's safer to walk on the streets of Baltimore at night than in the mountains of Wyoming in the daylight. The wilderness has 20 different ways to kill you. It's true. And so the idea that God will always clearly show us what we need to do in every situation is not realistic, not in a wilderness that has 20, if not more, reasons or ways to kill us. And so just to, to think that we could just follow a cloud is just not realistic. Life doesn't work that way. True faith, real trust is following God when you have no idea where you're going. Or when you can't make sense of what's happening in your life. That's the first thing. Here's another very important point. If you ever feel a little envious about these Old Testament people and wish you could just follow a cloud like they did, even if God did lead people, even if God did lead you that clearly, so obviously, what makes you think you would follow him? The people in the wilderness always knew where God was leading them, cloud by day, fire by night. But did they tend to like the places God brought them? No, not at all. In fact, they grumbled in the wilderness. They rebelled in the wilderness. They wanted to go back to Egypt. They thought Moses was not the right person to lead them. Time after time, we see this. They knew better than God did what was best for them. It's something we find over and over in the Bible. In fact, when God told Moses to go to Egypt, what did he say? Send someone else. Don't send me there. I don't want to go. When God says Jonah to go to Nineveh to preach to people, to bring them into a, a living relationship with God, he wants to have nothing to do with it. He goes in the exact opposite direction, taking a ship to the farthest end of the Western Sea. People in the Bible, more often than not, do not want to go where God leads them. Well, I wouldn't be like that, we say. I'd follow the cloud. Really? What makes you show, so sure of that? You know, the Bible gives us lots of instructions about how people who live in a relationship with God are supposed to behave. Forgive people who hurt you. Give generously to support the growth of God's kingdom here on earth. Give sacrificially. Give more than you think you can. Reconcile with people that you've hurt. Repent. Live in peace with everyone. Love everybody, especially the marginalized, the forgotten, the people who lack so many of the resources available to you. Care for the poor. Welcome the stranger. Time and again we read these simple instructions. Put the needs of others ahead of your own. Very clear. Very simple. How are you doing with all of that? Simply knowing what you ought to do doesn't mean you'll do it. There's a cloud of teaching, of pretty straightforward guidance and instruction that we have available to us in the Bible. How often do we read it? How interested are we in actually doing what the Bible tells us to do. 
So those are just two reasons why we shouldn't feel so envious of these Old Testament people who were led by the cloud. But here's an even bigger reason why we shouldn't think that God guided them so much more clearly than he guides us today. It's the biggest and best reason of all. God has given us an even better sign than they had. A much greater sign. Not a cloud way up in the sky somewhere. A person right here beside us in this dangerous, terrifying world that we inhabit. A brighter and clearer sign of God's glory. I'm talking about the Lord Jesus, of course. You remember how he was transfigured when he went on the mountain, Peter, James, and John were with him. He became radiant. You know, the glory of Jesus was rarely on display, hardly ever. But there it was in the transfiguration, the Son of God in all his radiant glory, so much so that Peter, James, and John fell flat on the ground. They, they, couldn't, they couldn't tolerate, they couldn't absorb the glory of God in the radiant face of Jesus Christ. The glory of God in a real person who, as the prologue to John's gospel says, came and dwelled among us. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. The literal Greek there is he pitched his tent. It's tabernacle language. He tabernacled with us, making us think back to that Old Testament tabernacle that we read about this morning. The book of Exodus concludes with the glory of God filling this tabernacle. Much of the latter part of Exodus consists of all kinds of instructions about how the tabernacle is to be constructed, what the priests are to wear, all of the sacrifices, and then when it's all done, the cloud, Exodus 40, the cloud of God's glory fills the tabernacle. And that cloud of glory is even more evident in the person of Jesus Christ. Isn't it interesting that Moses is with Jesus when he's transfigured? Moses and Elijah. Moses re-enters redemptive history on that mountaintop, talking with Jesus, as one of the gospel writers puts it, talking about his departure, literally his exodus. That's the Greek word, exodus. Moses knew something about exodus. But so did Jesus. In fact, his exodus is our exodus. It's our way out of the wilderness. It's salvation, it's deliverance, it's rescue. The true Moses, the greater Moses. The more obvious and eternal and powerful sign of God's glory. You know, clouds in the New Testament don't get talked about a whole lot. But almost every time a cloud is referenced in the New Testament, it is in direct reference to Jesus. At his transfiguration, the cloud enveloped him. At his ascension, a cloud hid him from the sight of those who watched him go up. When the return of Jesus is described a number of times, it is always said that he will return on the clouds. This is not just incidental, it's important. The cloud in the Old Testament refers to the glory of God, the presence of God, especially in the tabernacle and in the wilderness, and the clouds associated with Jesus Christ, no less so, in fact, far more so refer to his glory, the glory of God that tabernacled with us. Jesus, the glorious one, has pitched his tent with us in the wilderness. This is who Jesus is, the one who leads us on, who says to each and every one of us, as if for the very first time again this morning, follow me, follow me. So simple, so easy to understand, and so important. Perhaps you have yet to put your hand in the hand of the one that has stretched his hand out to you. It's the greatest decision a person can ever make. It gives you the, the confidence to live life in this dangerous and uncertain world with hope because you know you're not alone there. And even though life is very difficult and challenging at times, he's with us. He went into the wilderness too. For 40 days, calling to mind the 40 years of the Old Testament wandering of the people, the second Adam was obedient, trusting God when tested. The second people of Israel was faithful in that wilderness. He did this for us. 
He did this so that we can know no matter what wilderness we may find ourselves in, we'll find him there. It's what makes us think again about the name of our church and the pastor in the video alluded to it when he talked about how God didn't give them specific directions, no GPS. We're following a compass in this place. We don't know step-by-step -step instructions. It's no GPS guidance that says, turn here, go straight there. The compass is set in the direction that God calls us to be walking in and journeying toward. And as we do that, if we trust that he is the one who has invited us to step into this journey, we know he will be stepping alongside of us on every stage of this journey. That's what the cloud is all about. The cloud is God. The cloud is the glory of God. And God has brought us to himself most clearly, most powerfully, most wonderfully in the person of Jesus Christ. We can trust him. We can trust that all of the mistakes that we've made in life, all of the wrong choices that we've made, some of which are very serious and life impacting, are covered by the faithfulness of Jesus Christ. We can know that every future mistake we will make somehow mysteriously and graciously falls under the sovereign reign of God. You know, I was reading an obituary the other day. You know you're getting old when you start reading obituaries. And I don't read a lot of them, but I read this one. Because I find obituaries often contain some really beautiful, simple, and helpful guideposts for us. As we celebrate the lives of, of people, we, we learn from them. And in this one obituary, it's interesting that the man who passed away had an over 50 year marriage with a woman that he met when he dialed the wrong number and she picked up the phone. That's how it all began, by a mistake. Or was it? Sounds to me like he dialed the right number. It's what the Bible is all about, isn't it? God makes the wrong right. Justification is the big term for it. God justifies the ungodly. He makes the wrong right. And if he's done that, we can trust him. Even and especially in all of the hard and lonely places. There's one thing about the wilderness that's quite comforting. It might not always seem this way, but it's true. It's never a place that God intends people to stay they all enter, we all go into it, but God leads us out as surely as he leads us in. He leads us in and always out. And so we will always find on our way something there that speaks to us of God's presence, his grace, his care, his promises. We will find the Lord Jesus there, pitching his tent tabernacling with us, the glory of God in our wilderness. He will not let us go. So the word is trust. Trust the road. Trust your own heart and how you feel God is leading you. And most importantly, trust him. Trust him. I'd like to invite the music team to come up, and as they do, we're going to be praying, asking that God will enable us to receive and continue to appreciate the, the words, the messages that God has spoken to us this morning. I don't know where you are in your earthly journey. Maybe you are in a place of abundance, a place of joy and blessing. Maybe you're in a wilderness as we are all prone to find ourselves at times. God is there. Know that. Trust that. Celebrate that and find the grace and the love of Jesus Christ there with you. Let us pray. Thank you, Lord, for these words that you've given us, for this old story from the Bible that speaks to us of how you led your people by cloud, cloud by day, fire by night. You lead us still today, Lord, by the fire of your Holy Spirit in our hearts, <clears throat> in the person of your Son, Jesus Christ, the glorious, radiant King. Help us, Lord, to trust you. 
And for all who find themselves even today in a hard and desolate place, may they experience the joy and blessing of your presence there. And bring us all at last one day, Lord, out of the wilderness of all of our struggles into the peace and joy of your radiant kingdom. Amen. Everywhere I go, on this road high and low, where I go, I go with you. There's a city that calls me by name. There's a city that calls me by name. Yes, as I run this race, I am cheered by the saints. There's a city. Same spirit I cannot 